Welcome again to the Faithful Fathering Podcast. Thanks for joining us. This is Rick Wirtz, founder and president of Faithful Fathering, where the mission is to encourage and equip dads to be faithful fathers. And the vision is to engage dads in raising a godly generation by reinvigorating the church on the fathering front. Uh, this topic, uh, the topic for this podcast series is the Nehemiah Initiative. It's a, a construction project at the heart level for dads that uh, is analogous to or draws the example for, to uh, the wall Nehemiah built in 445 B.C. Uh, it was not a wall of, of isolation, but a wall of delineation that uh, Jerusalem needed to be different than the uh, surrounding lands. At that juncture, uh, the Israelites were going in and out of the city seven days a week. They were marrying foreign, foreign women. They were much more uh, like the surrounding lands than what the uh, holy city was called to be. So in this uh, second of the four podcast series, uh, we're, we're talking to Mr. Dan Davis. Dan, thank you for joining us again. Thank you for having me. And Dan is a, serves on city council in Man- Manville, Texas, and uh, is a husband and father of two, and is gonna share some insight with us as we uh, talk about this construction process. Uh, we've, we've built the, we've laid the foundation, which is our relationship with Christ. We. Uh, uh, talked about that at the last session. Uh, this session, we're going to start to build the walls on this solid foundation. And again, like I said, they're not walls of isolation, but walls of delineation, meaning that uh, uh, we're we're looking to be different than the world. We're supposed to be aliens in this world, not uh, we're in this world, not of this world, I think is how scripture lays it out. But uh, these walls are, there's 10 sections of wall in the, in the Jerusalem wall that I, at least the one, the depiction I found. And, uh, and I, I t- found it interesting that there are really 10 references to I am, uh, one from uh, God himself to Moses saying, uh, tell the Israelites that I am sent you, meaning that that's his name. And the Israelites, when they heard that name, they bowed down and said, uh, whatever you say, Moses, we're, we're in because we we know that that is God that called you. But then Jesus in the Gospel of John lays out nine I am statements of his own. And uh, I always found that fascinating because these are, uh, these are found, again, they point the way to how Jesus wants us to respond. And uh, the first three I like to reference are the I am statement is that uh, uh, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate for the sheep. You know, those were three pretty bold statements to be putting out there when he was talking to the Pharisees. Uh, uh, Any of those in particular resonate with you? Yeah. So I think the I am just in general represents that Jesus and and Christ can be what we need him to be when we need him to, to, to be it. That God is not, and Christ is not kept inside of a, a box. Mm. At different times in my own journey, as I'm sure in your journey, we've experienced different things where we've needed Christ to be a comforter. Mm. We've needed the encouragement. We've mm. needed the discipline. We've needed the the motivation to continue on. And whenever Christ says that I am, to me, it really speaks as to where I'm at in life. He is always there right beside me. And for those first three I am statements, the one that really stands out to me is really the the gate for the sheep, Mm. that he is going to protect us, that he is going to be there for us. It's not going to be easy. If we picture sheep outside, inside with walls and 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 a gate, you know, you're still exposed to the environment, the harshness of the environment, the warm, the, the cold, the wind, the potential, the hail, whatever you might experience in life. You're not immune from that, mm-hmm. but that you are kept in this enclosure, mm-hmm. that God is surrounding you, that even though you are in this world, you're not a part of this world, mm-hmm. as, the, as the saying goes. And so recognizing that God to us is a protector helps us fulfill the identity of being a protector to our children, being Mm -hmm. a protector to our family. Mm -hmm. That when my kids look at me, I hope that they see someone that's always going to be there for them, that's always going to protect them. That if anybody tries to go after my wife, if anybody tries to go after my my children, it is my responsibility and that not only my responsibility, but that I'll fulfill the responsibility of stepping in and saying, no, mm-hmm. that's not, that's not going to happen. That's mm-hmm. not going to, that's not going to be allowed. Mm-hmm. And so when we first see that 
Jesus through the I am statement is that to us, we can recognize how we can be that to our kids. Sure, sure. And uh, I think in politics, when he says, I am the bread of life and the light of the world, I would think that that also is, uh, you know, the bread of life is that we would, he was introducing an eternal perspective that uh, was just alien. You know, who would who would think of things eternally? We're trying to survive day to day, right? And I uh, think of the noise of politics day to day, you have to have that perspective, don't you, to, to yeah. think more eternally than, than necessarily uh, in the battles at the time. And you also have to think about how the battles of the time are not necessarily just the battles of current society, but there's also the the spiritual battles Mm -hmm. that are happening at the same time. I like to say that politics is not upstream of culture. Culture is upstream of politics. That what we're seeing happen in our current political environment is just not, it's not manufactured, but it's indicative of the society and the culture that we live in as well. And in those moments where you might be having these debates or making these decisions or drafting this legislation, to understand that there's something else happening beyond what I can just see. Mm -hmm. Or that the decisions that you make today are going to be felt 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 years in the in the future, mm-hmm. might be felt and experienced even after we're long and gone and we're up in heaven worshiping in the throne room. When you take that perspective of it's just greater than what you're currently in, there's a gravity and a responsibility that you step into <laughs> that allows you to hopefully be able to fulfill the the responsibility at hand in a responsible and mature way. Sure, and that uh, that's that's key to uh, to have that clarity and that discernment to uh, think beyond that. I mean, I will say that you know, as a man goes, a uh, marriage goes, as marriage goes, a family goes, as a family goes, a church goes, and as a church goes, society goes. So that kind of tells you something about where man is and where mm-hmm. marriage is and where the church is Absolutely. and where family is. Absolutely. So uh, that's that's why faithful fathering exists, because it is foundational. That what goes on in the family is foundational, what happens in the church, what happens in community. So um, spot on with you there that uh, we, we have that uh, eternal perspective to realize that our influence is long-lasting. We have the, he's the light of the world giving us that clarity in our day-to-day decisions. And then he's the gate. Uh, This is really a a lead-in that he's bringing us the opportunity to be saved, to have salvation through him as we uh, walk through that gate, right, into his comfort and his uh, his presence. The uh, second three are, uh, I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection. I am the vine. Uh, that again is a, is quite a series of statements for for Jesus to make as a man walking on this earth. It is, and it, one of the statements that really stands out to me is that when he talks about "I am the good shepherd," mm-hmm. it, the concept of being a shepherd is that you're leading your your sheep, that you're keeping them, you're keeping them in line. But at the same time, that if you have ninety nine sheep and one goes astray, that the shepherd will go and take care of the one and then bring it back to to the ninety nine. And in my life and the trajectory that my life has has taken, not only as being a man, but also being a father, that sometimes you're like, man, where am I? Where am I going with this? Like, what what's this journey that I'm on? Where are we going next? What's the end game with all of this? I'm a very analytical thinker, as I'm sure people are that are listening to this this podcast. Mm-hmm. You're calculating, you're considering, you're debating in your head that nobody else knows the debates that go on in your head except for you. But at the end of the day, I have to come to the realization that he's a good shepherd. He's leading me, even though this is the narrow path and it has its difficulties, it has its ups and ups and downs. Mm-hmm. He's leading me, and I have to trust that. And also, if I go astray, that he will come find me, Mm -hmm. that he'll constantly be chasing after me, constantly running after me, and that I can just understand that he is always going to be there for me. Mm -hmm. And then, with all of these things, as we understand that's what our identity is in our relationship with Christ, we can hopefully walk into that identity with our kids as well, Mm -hmm. that we can point them on the narrow path, we can give them all the guidance in the world, but they might go astray mm-hmm. some, sometimes. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, I think as, as parents and as fathers, we need to present an environment where our kids know that it's okay to fail and that we're going to be there for them. Mm-hmm. That if they happen to go astray, we are there for them. Mm-hmm. We'll be there to talk through things with them. We'll be able, there to help them help them out and that it's okay to fail. But when you fail, you've got to learn from your lessons. Let's pull you back in and okay, Hey, son, you know, I told you that if you run really fast near this curb, you'll probably trip and scratch your knee. You probably shouldn't run near that. 
So let me point you again in the right direction, and hopefully you stay on the on the right path. I always like the story of the young lady that wanted to be a she wanted to be a, a college level soccer player, and he says, "Okay, we'll get out there on the field. You need to make about a ten thousand errors on the field to become that kind of a profi- to become proficient at your sport." So uh, you know, failure is part of the le- learning process, and uh, so I agree a hundred percent that that whole idea of uh, of that good shepherd uh, you know, that requires your responsibility as a father to lead as well. You're being led by Christ and his word, uh, but then you have to turn around and lead as well, don't you, That uh, that uh, as we as we do that. Now, he also, he says he's the resurrection and he's the vine. He says, I am the vine, um, my father is the gardener, you're the branches. So abiding in the vine is, a, is a, a bit of, you know, these are all three kind of pointing to the obedience that you referenced in the previous session, right? Anything that, that when you think about abiding, what a, does that complement the obedience that we talked about before? Uh, absolutely. I think if we look at the life of Jesus, that before everything happened with his persecution and his death and burial and resurrection, that he took time away mm-hmm. to abide, mm-hmm. to just spend time with God. Mm-hmm. And that's where we read about the prayers and it's, you know, take this cup from me, but I'll drink of this cup. And his other disciples, they fell, they fell asleep. But he was abiding. Mm-hmm. And it's in those moments of of stillness, of abiding, of being, not necessarily doing, but of being that we can receive the clarity that we need to be the shepherd. Mm -hmm. And even uh, abiding could even be in a more practical sense, surrounding yourself with mentor mentors Mm -hmm. and and examples Mm -hmm. of how you can be a good, a good shepherd and Mm -hmm. just abiding in their presence because they've walked the path before you. Mm -hmm. They've experienced successes and failures that you can hopefully learn from and avoid those pitfalls in your own life. So as you abide with, with God, as you spend time with him, as you envelop yourself with, with him, You'll be able to learn from reading the Bible and spending time with him about how to be a good shepherd. Mm-hmm. Same thing with, with friends. That's the reason why they say who you surround yourself with as a company is reflective of who you are as a, as a person as well. True. Because when you abide in certain areas of your life, you begin to reflect that. Mm-hmm. So where are you abiding? Yeah. Where, are you, where are you spending your time? As a, as a father, are you spending your time in areas that you probably shouldn't? Because if you are, then you're reflecting that to your kids. Mm-hmm. You're reflecting that to your wife. Mm-hmm. And as Christians, is that really where we want to be, or do we want to be reflecting Christ and the principles that we find in the Bible? Sure, sure. Well, the first three I am statements pointed to, you know, provided the salvation in Christ. The second three called us to a level of obedience. And then he wraps it up by saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now, that's a, quite a call to a mature relationship, isn't it? It absolutely, it absolutely is. And, and maturity can come in different paces and at different at different times. Mm-hmm. And I think maturity comes from our mistakes because then we then we learn what not to do and hopefully grow and get better and don't make those mistakes again. Yeah, Lord, you not you sure this isn't the way I'm supposed to go, Lord? Why are you knocking me back this way, right? Exactly, exactly. God, <laughs> Jesus can show us where to go. He can be the light that illuminates the path for us. But it's up to us to ultimately walk down that that path and. I like to say that, you know, when you're walking down that path, you might step on a few Legos, you might bump into the wall a, a few well, times. with kids six and eight, yeah. <laughs> it's but, but my kids 33 and 35, that's not no, an issue. No, you <laughs> don't necessarily have have that issue. But then you learn, you, know, right? you step on a Lego once, so okay, before the kids go to bed, I'm cleaning the hallway because sure, sure. I don't want to step on a Lego again. <laughs> now, uh, it says, uh, you know, we're, we're talks about truth. He references, I am the truth. Is that... Uh, having young kids, uh, how are you doing at uh, navigating through this relative truth that dominates this world? I think for, for truth that you have to be open to your truth being challenged. 28 years old, 29 years old, I messed up again about my age. So I'm still getting, still getting used That's to it. Right. I think I just want to reject gets, that I'm 29 because uh, I'm, o- as you get I know, I'm almost 30 and I don't want to, I don't want to <laughs> believe that. But what I know to be true, what I've learned in my life, I have to be open to that being challenged and to being pushed. And I think that's a key part of having mentors in, in your life mm-hmm. is they'll be able to, to challenge you and they'll be able to push you and they'll be able to say, okay, it's interesting that you think of it that way. Take, let's take a look at this. Have you considered it this way? And when you're open to being molded from the biblical truth per- perspective, 
and you're constantly challenging yourself, you can become more, as we talked about in the last podcast, you can become more solidified and have a stronger foundation in what you believe. Mm-hmm. When, you look to, when you look to Christ, when you look to the Bible, and you learn and you establish your truth from a biblical worldview, then whenever you go out into the world and your truths are getting challenged because you have the biblical truths, then you have that solid foundation to, to stand on. Mm-hmm. It's like the, the parable that Jesus talks about. Are you going to have a house that's built on a rock or are you going to have a house that's built on sand? Sure. Because when the storms come and when a society that is, is constantly trying to pound away and chip away at the biblical truth of w- what we see in this world, if you have that solid foundation, then you'll be able to withstand. And as a father, your kids will be able to see you do that. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's an extremely important thing because when I come home at night, I want to be able to look my kids in the eyes and say, your dad did it the right way. And if I did it the right way, you can do it the right way. But if I'm not reaffirmed and confident in the the truth and as Christ being the truth and what he teaches in the Bible as being the truth, then I'm going to go out into the world and I'm going to go to my workplace. I'm going to go and engage and encounter people and then become Mm wishy-washy. And what does that represent to our Mm -hmm. kids? I don't Mm -hmm. think that represents or reflects the image of Christ. And the absolute, uh, that's when you talk about biblical truth, you're talking about the absolute truth versus relative truth in the world, whether it's uh, sexuality, relationships, anything else. There's an absolute that we reference. That doesn't mean that that we, uh, you know, love is an absolute too. We love all all situations, but uh, we also know that there's an absolute design that God has for us. And uh, we get, things go a lot better when we fall into that design. And uh, so that's the absolute truth that we're really uh, talking about. So when he says the way, the truth, and the life, there is just one truth, one way, one, uh, one life. So that's, uh, that's the life of Jesus the Christ. So uh, as you re- reflect on, on, the, uh, on the walls, you know, what I, I try to dry, draw that analogy that as these I am statements are not only telling us about Christ telling us by himself, it's, it's him calling us to a new level of who we're to be like. We're to be more Christ-like today than yesterday, more so tomorrow than today. So uh, when these walls get to their full height, then we're, we're solid and we got those, uh, our defenses up to the full. Uh, anything about, uh, we talk about uh, the three, uh, you know, the, the way to salvation, the call to obedience, and then the expectation of a maturity. Uh, any of those three particularly you see that are different heights in, in your life? Absolutely. So I would say as being a, a young father, as being a, a young man, I've always been one of the, the youngest to have a, a seat at the table in, mm-hmm. in, in that sense. I've always had to take the perspective that I'm going to have to work extra hard, that I, because God has had our path be different, that in a variety of different areas, I have to go above and beyond maybe what some other people might need to might need to do, mm-hmm. whether that be going into a city council meeting, I need to be extra prepared, whether that be whenever my wife was pregnant with our son or with our, with our daughter, us taking time and me reaching out to people and saying, I need you to tell me how to be a father. Mm-hmm. What, is, what, is that, what does that look like? Mm-hmm. What are some of the things that I need to be prepared for? Mm-hmm. And that whenever you work towards that and whenever you have to take that mindset on of working above and beyond, you know, there's in sports, I love sports, played sports growing up. There was always the saying that you need to be the, the first, first in the room and the, the last one, the last one to, to leave. And so I've always strived to do, to do that. But I think where I've had the, the challenge in my own life is finding people to, in a sense, do life with. Mm-hmm. And, and what I mean by, by that is I always believe that there should be three aspects that you experience in life in regards to you have mentors that are above you. That's one aspect. You have peers that are alongside you. That's one aspect. And then you have people that you're mentoring and you're investing mm-hmm. into yourself. And that's, mm-hmm. a, that's a third aspect. And so in my life personally, I have some incredible mentors who have been able to speak into my life that I've given them permission and authority to speak into my life. Mm -hmm. And it's been a tremendous blessing for me. I've found opportunities to pour and to invest into people who maybe are at the same place that I was a few years ago. And Mm -hmm. I can talk to them and invest in them and share with them. Mm -hmm. But where I've struggled is finding those those peers, those Mm -hmm. people that are kind of at that same place in life with you guys, Mm -hmm. my wife and I. And you can kind of share your challenges with each other, bounce around ideas and, and collaborate. 
And that's something that I think a lot of us challenge in life. And mm. as fathers, you can feel very isolated at, at times mm. because you might still have friends that aren't fathers or you have people that ignore their responsibilities as being fathers. And you're like, man, it would be so much easier if I just went out and did that with my friends who are ignoring their responsibilities as fathers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that's not what God's called us. God's right. called us to do. Right. So I've had to really strive to be intentional in finding like-minded peers to surround myself with, to right. connect with, to do life with. And I've come up short in that area many, many times, but it's it's a constant striving in my life. Well, that's what Paul says when he says we should not stop meeting together, right? That that's a church family that hopefully we can have all three of those dimensions available in our church family. Even if it isn't our, the church we attend, it'd be our church, uh, you know, our, our friends, our spiritual, our, our Christian friends. So that's a, that's a great uh, step. And that's, uh, you know, that's the Paul Barnabas uh, relationship in Timothy. Uh, that is, is very powerful as well. So that's the call, men, to, uh, to as you build this wall, these, these sections of wall to their full height is to understand that we embrace the salvation Jesus offers, we, we uh, learn to obey to a new level, and uh, we mature in relationship with Christ as we uh, move forward. So in this session, we've, uh, we've now uh, we've laid, out, laid the foundation, we've uh, constructed the wall, built the walls, and our next session we'll uh, address uh, constructing the gates and putting them in place as we uh, continue this construction project. So dads, thanks again for tuning in. Again, I point you to faithfulfathering.org to hit the four dads button to access any of the studies that we do including this Nehemiah Initiative study. But in the meantime, uh, just uh, keep your uh, eyes on, uh, on Christ and uh, keep walking with him and uh, be the influence that you're called to be. Because that's the dad you're called to be and that's the dad the next generation needs. God bless and God speak.